allowed you to um, stretch your legs. Um, don't know about you, but it's the microphone digging into my sensitive ears. Um, so that's good. Welcome back. So um, we um, will aim to finish as near to four as, as we possibly can. So uh, without more ado, uh, we're going to uh, move into uh, introducing uh, Abdul. And uh, Abdul and I are going to do uh, an interview to start rather than a presentation. Are we not, Abdul? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, we thought that as, this, uh, we, as we discussed how we were going to lead into this bit of the discussion, mm. um, Abdul said he didn't want to do a um, presentation. So this is going to be much more like um, a radio intro. So uh, thanks for being there, Abdul. And if you can for, hear for, me, for, John, you, you totally froze. I got the last bit. Um, Abdul okay. is, yeah, sorry. Okay. Can you hear me okay now? I can hear you. I can hear you definitely. And you froze um, just as you said, Abdul and I are going to do an uh, interview or something. Like that. <laughs> well, yeah. in, in that case, I shall be slightly less chatty and fire off a question and hope that that gets through okay. okay. Um, Abdul, um, first of all, tell us who you are and what is your professional background? Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, First of all, can I just say that what a wonderful sort of stimulating sort of conversations there are here, raising for me far more questions. And I'm kind of um, thinking more about what I wrote uh, as a result of the last two discussions and reflecting on them. Um, I, I'm, a, uh, I'm a lecturer at De Montfort University. I lecture in policing and investigations. Previous to that, I served in the Metropolitan Police uh, Service for 30 years, the last 18 in various roles on and off in the field of counter-terrorism and counter-extremism. I retired in 2016. Uh, I remain a practitioner um, in counter-terrorism and violent extremism, but in a more removed way. So for example, I'm involved in training uh, international, internationally police officers in sort of counter-terrorism, community engagement work in particularly, uh, and also um, I'm interested in communication work to reduce counterterrorism propaganda and recruitment online, stuff like that. Um, and my research interests sort of include the ethics of terrorism and counterterrorism as well as policing ethics. Um, I also have a, just sort of, say, I, I've kind of very much uh, interested in this field because of my own personal background as well. I, I kind of, from a Bangladeshi background, grew up in, here, in, in this country with many people who, um, some of whom went on to join jihadist organizations in the 80s and so on. And I was always interested why they did that. Um, but also because, you know, my faith, Islam, is, is very important to me. And, um, and so I kind of interested in, from that perspective in which how Islam gets perceived and played by various parties to push their own agendas and so on. So is your faith very important to you in your work? For sure, for sure. But, I mean, yeah. yes, it, it's, it, it is from the perspective of that I don't recognize um, the Islam that's portrayed by people with agendas, political agendas. And that's not just the jihadist groups. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if I asked you what gets you up in the morning, what provides your motivation to work on counter-terrorism, what would you say? Well, it is that. It, it, it is. I think terrorism is, is um, whichever way you look at it, it's such a heinous crime, the taking away of innocent lives. And there are lots of arguments put forward around innocence and things like that. But I, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in how do you stop something that has such a huge impact on many people and victims who, are not, who have nothing to do with the conflicts mm. that are the cause of um, the terrorism, if that makes sense. Mm. Okay, well, we've circulated your paper in advance and your paper uh, is going to be on our website so other people will have a chance to access what is, uh, I think you could safely describe this as a, as a deep dive into, uh, into your concerns and your issues. Um, and there's lots of material there. Um, 
you're clearly very passionate about, about this subject. What are your main concerns uh, you know, in 2020? What are your main concerns about uh, counter-terrorism and what you want to communicate to this seminar this afternoon? Well, can I put it another way, Johnny, if that's all mm. right, having listened to the conversations? And sure, things, you can. Sort of perhaps... Um, just sort of try to capture the main points of my paper and then perhaps just raise some questions as a result. Sure. And, and, and particularly um, some of the conversations that's uh, occurred, especially I was very interested in what Vivian was saying. Um, I guess the main points from my paper really, are if, we, if we look at terrorism today, it's probably more global, transnational and complex than in the past. Uh, although fundamentally also it's still the same. It's essentially political acts that seek to sort of what distinguishes, I think, terrorism from other crimes and so on is that it's a political act that seeks to disrupt some sort of status quo in, um, in, in a political order, whether that be a local terrorist group uh, attempting to change or overthrow um, a regime or so, or international terrorism uh, sort of as in the ambitions of jihadist groups such as Daesh and Al-Qaeda trying to overthrow an international order if you like and if we look at how terrorism campaigns come to an end uh, really I think there's a sort of um, there's a number of uh, ways you can categorize how past terrorism campaigns have come to an end failure for example is one you know a lot of terrorist campaigns fail to gather sufficient staying power or and fail to survive for any prolonged period of time to achieve their strategic and or political aims. The international terrorist threat we face by jihadist groups at the moment has you know, certainly existed before 9-11, mm. but we've seen a huge counter-terrorism effort post 9-11, almost 17 years on now, or 18 years on now almost, and you know, how far have we progressed in that campaign and, and so on. Other ways that sort of um, methods by which terrorism campaigns are brought to an end are things like decapitation, where states kill and assassinate people, uh, repression, where state crushes the terrorist organization by force, uh, and negotiation. And of course, that clearly requires particular sets of conditions and timings to be effective and, can, you know, in order not to be counterproductive. The most effective means that we're told, uh, and several terrorist scholars, scholars talk about this, is considered to be intelligence. And so this is believed to be vital to any counter-terrorism campaign, um, allowing security services, police, and other state actors to take some sort of initiative, arrest terrorist actors, financiers, and supporters, and so on. And uh, certainly for some, uh, intelligence is necessary not just in pursuing terrorists but in contributing towards peace as well so in countering terrorism we need to be thinking about peace it, mm. which is something really important um, and the global medium for cooperation of course is the United Nations since 9-11 it's created 13 different conventions and 16 universal legal agreements to deal with terrorism it developed a counter-terrorism strategy in 2006, which required countries to implement individual and collective measures to address the spread of terrorism, strengthen their own individual collective capacity to prevent and combat terrorism, protect human rights, and uphold rule of law while countering terrorism. What I found very disappointing, and, and in trying to answer that question that you sent me, which is around, you know, anti-terrorism, how can and countries must cooperate, is that while many governments gave rhetorical support to that strategy and still do, many have also implemented action plans selectively rather than in the comprehensive manner that was agreed and that is required for counterterrorism to be effective. Many have failed um, to sort of in, uh, implement action plans, for example, on human rights, on uh, rule, uh, and many kind of flout international rule of law in, in their counterterrorism strategies. Uh, and because of the limitations and shortfalls of how the United Nations operates, 
it can only serve as a venue for cooperation to the extent that member countries want to cooperate and implement the strategy as a whole. So they pick and choose and so on. I think what's really important for me out of those four factors that the, the counterterrorism strategy at the UN has been agreed to is a bit about protecting human rights and upholding mm. rule of law. Terrorism is caused by many factors. Uh, two important ones is injustice, senses of grievance, uh, and and and, uh, and uh, yeah, sorry, uh, it, two factors: injustice and the sense of grievance, um, uh, and perceptions of grievance as well. So, I think my question for discussion then is that if we look at, uh, at one cooperation that's been deemed success, and that's the European Union arrest warrant. Um, that came into force, luckily for us here in the United Kingdom, it was implemented and agreed upon just before the, the July the 21st attempted bombings here in London in 2005. And it was an agreement that was really significant because it, shift, it was it allowed the fast track extradition of people wanted for terrorism based on evidence. And it was shifted from a sort of a, a, a political kind of basis to one which is judged on the basis of evidence and a judicial one, if that makes sense. And so it's yeah, quicker yeah. And, and so on. And I, I guess the question I'd like to pose there is, do we need to be thinking about a shift in how countries, the process and the mediums and how countries um, uh, cooperate with each other and move it from a political process and the institutions such as the United Nations to one where there's cooperation on a judicial basis between judicial authorities and counterterrorism agencies. And it goes back a little bit to Anna's, um, I was fascinated by Anna's kind of first presentation where there was appeared to be a lot of cooperation between practitioners and, and, and so on, people in the field. Um, so I wonder, is there some benefit in kind of moving, thinking about how we do international counterterrorism? Because it seems to me, if it's shifted to a judicial basis rather than political processes and shifted to one uh, which is done on sort of evidence-based and a legal process, um, it, it, we're going to have that much more credibility uh, uh, amongst different populations, I think there'll be more attention paid to rule of law, human rights, and so on. But that in itself kind of then poses many questions. How do we sort of uh, reach this sort of cooperation? How realistic is it? Would it stop practices like state assassinations and sort of decapitation of terrorist uh, sort of leaders and, and things like that? Uh, etc. Um, yeah, so I put it out like that. And who'd be the ultimate sort of um, arbiter of disputes between countries and right. things like that? Lots there, sorry. <laughs> well, more than lots there. Yeah. Now, that is a really big question. Yeah. Now, yeah. what I'm going to suggest is yeah. we slightly change the way we handle the time we've yeah. got left. Yeah. Um, Bill, I'd like to give you an alert that what I'm going to suggest is that we bring your presentation in in a minute or two, because um, if you, th I'm just going to check that you're okay with this, Bill, because your paper was about engaging with um, authoritarian regimes, and I'm just wondering whether we could um, put Abdul's question alongside your input. Do you think that would work, Bill? We'd like to unmute Bill. Yeah, Bill, could you unmute? That's great. Could you? Do you think you um, would? Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's absolutely fine. I've certainly got questions for Abdul. Um, that some burning questions that I can't wait to make. <laughs> yes. Okay. So wh wh what I'm going to say was that I, I what I'd like to suggest is that we put the two um, presentations side by side and then open it up. Um, so with your forbearance, Abdul. Um, no, I think that would be really useful. I, be really I, I useful. think it's hot. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. um, I'm going to ask everybody's forbearance. We're going to move into, into a short introduction of Bill Mather. Uh, 
who is very different from other presenters. We, on the, the network, we want to have different sorts of voice. Uh, Bill Mather uh, is, uh, is representing uh, the independent sector. Um, uh, he was the founder of Social Pioneers, which is uh, an, an NGO, and has worked uh, on international development projects uh, in uh, the Middle East and uh, the Far East, as well as in the, in the UK. Uh, so he's not uh, coming from a state sector perspective, but that of maybe more of a business uh, perspective. And Bill, with that introduction, I'd like to hand, give the, the floor to you, uh, and then we'll uh, address Abdul's question and maybe uh, any that you raise for our, our last time together. So over to you, Bill. Well, I've decided um, to talk through uh, a case study that reflects what um, my paper is, is pointing at, and that's um, about Kazakhstan. John knows Kazakhstan exceedingly well and was uh, working we were working together there, but I wonder if anyone else has ever been to Kazakhstan? No. No. Nope. So, brief description. Um, Central Asia, it's the size of Western Europe. It became an independent country at the fall of the Soviet Union in 1993. Um, it sits in between China and Russia. It's close to Afghanistan. And it's seen as a potential breeding ground for terrorism. So that's where we start to get our connectivity. Yeah. It's therefore attracted a lot of interest internationally for geopolitical reasons about how it can be supported. But it is a benevolent dictatorship. There are, there are elections, but there's no opposition. Um, there's control of the media. Public protests are banned. Um, but it has quite a relaxed atmosphere, certainly in the larger cities. Russian is the language. In 2015, the first president, who therefore been president since the birth of the country, um, set a hundred steps of change to take place across the whole public sector. This included criminal justice, um, eliminating torture, anti-corruption programs, establishing um, independent, competent judiciary, modernizing probation. Um, it was huge. And he was highly motivated to do this, though he'd been there for 25 years, because he was getting old and knew he would have to retire in a few years, which he did. He retired um, last year. Is the economy was going down because of dependency upon oil. Um, and he um, wanted to get better efficiencies and lower costs out of the money being spent on public services, which were clearly very inefficient. Public trust exceedingly low in pretty well everything, but certainly criminal justice high corruption in the police, and that was everyone's expectation. So in the midst of this, um, he set out reforms, and they were not delivering. Uh, by the time that um, John and I arrived in the country, um, they were very largely about creating new laws without how these laws should be implemented, or getting ownership, or having any consultation. Just down laws. It's all Soviet style. Um, but the EU, uh, very concerned about this uh, potential for a country to go into mayhem, 
um, was funding and is still funding some pretty big significant programs and the one that John and I worked on was about the reform supporting the reform of the criminal justice system. Um, this started with the General Prosecutor's Office and pretty well everything in Kazakhstan um, you hear the title and you kind of get a Western take on what it means but actually general prosecutors have draconian powers they could prosecute enter into any building any company private sector public sector um, any community and they could invent uh, and prosecute or be bribed um, 5,500 prosecutors, another 3,000 staff, and in 25 years of being in existence separately, they haven't actually made a single solitary change. They were still operating in military uniform as uh, the Russian stroke uh, Soviet model. The new general prosecutor came in determined to actually sort this out. Um, he, in his first four, mo four months, introduced um, appointments on merit as opposed to patronage. Uh, the best of the best, he called it. Um, over 40 change projects focused only on the HQ. But this is in a context where there was no vision uh, strategy, project management disciplines, it was just complete ad hoc. And that's where we made contact and um, he asked if we could help sort this out and could we get strategy developed. And we did that by breaking all the rules. Um, not going through their top tier of management in the hierarchical autocratic fashion, but getting next generation leaders who were fairly well positioned and together represented across the board and training them to think differently, to act differently, to not look for command and control all the time, to have proper creative explorations and discussions, and to do all of that without the uniform on. Um, so we created an environment where we had a working group that could work up recommendations on vision, mission, and strategy for the general prosecutor, who, when he got something he wanted, would turn it over to the president. Um, so we started off understanding that there was no history of discussion, innovation, planning um, of any kind, not just in the general prosecutor's office, but across the whole criminal justice system. So we had to develop uh, um, methodologies. Um, we had to help them create a strategy that they owned and felt was the direction of travel they needed to lump um, together projects under strategic objectives, set up a project management office um, and capacity build it. And this took place at rather a rapid pace. Um, within um, six months, it was leading to a new law being put forward on reducing the role and functions of prosecutors so that they concentrated on criminal cases only, um, restructuring the department, um, eliminating corruption, um, interagency justice centres were established, totally new kind of concept, and the public became the focus of what prosecution was all about, alongside the state, but not instead. Um, the state instead of the public. And part of this, because it's such a colossal country, um, was also about 
training people right across the regions. Um, and we called them change agents. And we had to uh, train them in how to consult with their colleagues, how to get bottom up ideas and innovations properly looked at for change and transformation, and basically an empowering culture and totally different to what they were used to. I use that as an example and then say, well, we were there for the whole criminal justice system. What happened next was this was seen as proof of concept because it really did uh, shift for the very first time one large and very powerful part of the justice system. We were then asked to help with the Supreme Court, um, with the High Judicial Council, um, with the Ministry of Interior, on police, probation, um, and others. And it began a movement, and a movement that is still going on. We finished about two years ago. Um, so I'm still staying in, in touch. The point was that this isn't about providing bits of technical expertise. It's about changing the culture, the mindsets, the understandings, the commitments, the motivations. And it's also about recognizing that there are bad apples out there, mm. but there are also a lot of really good, frustrated people who just go along with what they find themselves in. Mm. Um, so I hope that Kazakhstan is now less likely to be nurturing terrorism <laughs> than it would have been. Thanks very much, Bill. Um, what that illustration gives was that, in a way, you had to dive in at the top level because, you know, what the only levers for change existed at the top level. So, shall we go back to um, uh, Abdul's uh, challenge? Um, Perhaps you could repeat your question and then we'll open this up to uh, everybody, Abdul, and we'll get that idea of the risk to uh, the global community because of counter-terrorism, of course of terrorism taking root in a whole different types of society. But Abdul, back to you to have your voice and then we'll open it up for discussion. Yes, I think, thank you for that, Bill. That was really, you know, fascinating. And I think also for me, um, I couldn't agree with you more. I guess the, the, the point around what I was trying to talk about is how do we bring in soft counter-terrorism skills and things into countries and then the softer policing of terrorism uh, rather than just supplying, especially us in the West, uh, supplying sort of and giving capacity building in just a technical sense as well, because there's all sorts of means of oppression with that kind of um, support as well in, in countries. So my country, my Going back to my question then, it, was, it, it is how do we sort of, how do we cooperate and encourage cooperation internationally between countries such that it, the, the, it, it, it encourages more adherence, if you like, to rule of law behavior, uh, both by those of us who seem to have more expertise in the West in terms of countering terrorism and so on as well. Uh, and you know, and, and how do we um, kind of foster um, a governance of, of a country in a way that it is more human rights compliance to, with its populations and so on, and therefore reducing the, um, reducing the sort of conditions and things that bring around grievances mm -hmm. that lead to terrorism and so on. Um, and it seems to right. me to, that the, the, the model that you've presented there is one particular way, but you've come at it from the top strategic. If we think about the Arab Spring and so on, how, and, and we think about what's going on now with the current Black Lives Matters, how do we also galvanize that energy um, of youth uh, and so on from the bottom end in order to bring about changes and, and so on? Okay, who would like yeah. to run with that question, please? Well, 
I, I'd just sort of say a couple of things to it. it I come from a very different perspective, um, having worked also in international development, but very much from the bottom up. I've worked in rural communities, um, primarily around health, HIV, AIDS, but also uh, gender and violence mm -hmm. and so on. So I, it's a very different sort of aspect that I come from. Um, and I do think that what Bill was talking about with respect to building the participation, gathering everyone's energy and doing so by getting sort of collective action together um, is very much spurred on by the ability to communicate, not necessarily the high IT, ICT that we have, but more through the power of voice and the power of getting this commonality of purpose together. Um, and being a communication and a behavioral change sort of person for the last 25 years, Five years, they, that sort of element of bringing collective action together through the power of voice is something I'd certainly put on the table as an element um, to bring in, you know, to the whole discussion on how you how you uh, successfully bring change. Mm. So I can go into ridiculous. Yeah, detail, well, do say, I'll, do I'll, say I'll some more. Talking. Oh, you'll be talking about that next time. That there's everybody. Yeah. That, that's a, a really good moment to mention that on the 30th of June, there'll be another Zoom uh, and Nikki will be getting into that. Um, okay, so that's about the, the, the need to communicate and to get a, almost a community of interest to provide the energy and the drive for change. Thank you. Uh, any other points to come in to pick that up? One of the things that I would like to reflect on is that um, very frequently um, we tend to have either a top-down model or a bottom-up. And one of the things that Bill's case study identified was uh, the need to engage with different levels in a system. Uh, and if you s concentrate only on the top, and forget that you need to have change leadership coming from uh, change agents, uh, dynamic uh, people who represent the future. Um, and I think that, uh, in a way, uh, harnessing the gifts and the talents of young people uh, are, are really, really vital. And uh, Abdul uh, mentioned you know, Black Lives Matter. And it seems to me that one of the things that uh, we've already mentioned about the COVID-19 uh, circumstances is that um, maybe the tide can turn on something really as significant in uh, our, our, our history is when people have time to reflect and the Me Too movement uh, there was a welling up of uh, not just emotion, but the reality that things just had to change. And it may well be that COVID-19 has provided that opportunity for a, a set of drivers to change. And it was something that Nick, I think, uh, said that time for reflection might mean that that will be a, that timing is also really important. And I think that, uh, with the Kazakhstan case uh, study, uh, it might not just be the timing, but also the, the leadership being available to take the risks. And Bill, in one of his comments earlier, talked about trust and leadership and being important that people are prepared to take risks. So um, if there's a dearth of trust and good leaders around, maybe that's that makes makes change particularly hard um would anybody else like to yeah. pick that point up yeah without answering the the point or the question but responding to it i, I was curious or fascinated with the uh the silence that followed the question that was posed and to some extent i wonder uh and i'm not sure about this but i wonder does it go back to a point i think bill made it earlier on and you've just referred to it again john which is about the trust and the risk and i think the some for me anyway just speak for myself i think the points that abdul and bill have made and the questions they pose carry 
for us as respondents to them a certain amount of risk. You know, they're, they're mm. more, mm. if you'll forgive me using the word explosive, you know, terrorism and so on, mm. is something that me and maybe other people feel, might feel the same, uh, more reluctant to voice a, a, a view on. Whereas, for example, I would be much more comfortable uh, you know, talking about Fergus McNeil's blog about, you know, probation client interactions. Clearly, Nikki is very comfortable with parallels to what Abdul and Bill were talking about, but that's because she has experience clearly in, in that area. I just think the whole area, and, and, and I think it's instructive for us as a group or this network, that there will be certain areas where it's more risky for people to come out front and say I'd like to express this idea or I have a mm. thought even though I've no idea uh, from my own experience where this might go and I think mm. Bill and Abdul have been touching on that type of an area so really what I'm saying is I think there's a lesson there mm. in terms of how the network operates and people communicate I have no idea how to respond to the specific question mm. okay th thanks I, I for voicing that Sorry. Abdul, and then Johan wants to come in, but Abdul first. Sorry, I think that's a really interesting observation, and I, I was thinking the same. It, it is very difficult to talk about these things and things, and um, especially, yeah, when, whenever you start talking about these things, you ask me a question around whether my religion was important to me. Um, now, you might have detected a sort of sense of, um, hesitation in my answering well that's because all, all the sort of um, narratives and discourse that lies around religious terrorism and specifically Islamist religious terrorism if they, if they say so so I, I think it's a really kind of valuable kind of reflection from um, uh, from uh, Vivian I, I think it's very very valuable reflection mm -hmm. Johan, would you like to come in now? Uh, you need to unmute, Johan. Um, Rob, oh, there we go. Good, we can hear you now. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was really fascinated by this uh, case study and uh, by Abdul's story uh, about terrorism. Uh, and I, I really like this kind of approach of, uh, you know, taking the systemic uh, approach to, to a reform or to international development. Um, but in my experience, uh, it's, it's, it, it happens very rarely when we have this luxury of uh, being able to impact on the whole system. Uh, so I think it's, it's also important in international development work to, to pay attention to small changes that can really make a significant uh, transformation into the into the system. For instance, uh, in a country like in Kazakhstan or in Kyrgyzstan or uh, Tajikistan, countries where I, I have been before, I think it, it would be also uh, useful to have a, a small change like changing the the the, the management uh, practice, the management style uh, within the state the public institutions, and to make the the management a little bit more participatory, more collaborative. And I think this can really empower young people to get involved in uh, getting, you know, active in decision making and, and so on. And this can produce also some kind of change. So I, I really like this kind of systemic approach. Uh, but we should not underestimate uh, the, the importance of uh, small changes that can really impact mm -hmm. on, on systems from inside. Thanks, Johan. Um, are there any other hands going up at the moment? Thank you, Bill. We'd like to come back. And, and, Nick, and Nick in a moment, yeah. So uh, we'll go Bill first, so unmute Bill and then Nick. Um, Abdul. Yes. <laughs> um, with regard to ISIS. Yes. Uh, in particular. Um, it's often referred to as having an ideology. And I've often wondered, is it an ideology where it is about the power of hate, killing, raping, generating fear? Um, 
and arbitrary about where it's done and to whom. Um, so is it an ideology? Um, it's, it is a form of ideology, I think. And it's built, like all ideology, on, on some sort of tradition, uh, some sort of uh, something that has resonance amongst people. Um, whether it's arbitrary in terms of where it's going or not, I'm not so sure. I think it has very clear goals in what it wants to achieve, what it wants to disrupt, and how it wants to do it. And I think that, you know, it, it plays to that very well in how it sells its message, how it uh, uh, attracts people, and how it offers an alternative um, to a vision to, uh, for some people. Uh, and feeds into grievances and so on. Yeah, yeah. I, I, there is a form of ideology to it, though, without a short of doubt, but it's not just the ideology. There's so much more other factors that make that ideology attractive to people rather than the ideology itself. And Nick would like to come in, so over to you. Yeah, I mean, I'll just very quickly just follow that point with uh, the list that was given and in the current climate, how you maybe can relate that same list to slavery. Mm. Um, and I think that's a really interesting sort of observation in the current climate. Um, I, I was just, I, again, I don't have an answer to the question, but I think I was just thinking about some of the principles um, and Bill mentioned proof of concept. And, and I guess they were talking about an evidence-based approach to practice, whether the, the the, um, the, the thing that we've identified that works is little or big, is significant or not. Having an evidence-based approach is important. And uh, I guess maybe the challenge for international development is, uh, one of them is how you share that. In what format do you share it? Where do you share it? Where, what is the receptacle for it? And there's almost on top of that a proof of concept of the best ways of doing that. So it's a, like a multi-layered evidence-based approach to that. And I think that's, I think that's a, a challenge and, a, and an open question. Um, and I guess the other point I'd make is really about the uncomfortable things that we've been able to discuss today. You know, we've talked about different things like the Me Too movement, like Black Lives Matter, like terrorism, and um, creating in, in development terms creating spaces where uh, you know um, it is okay to debate these things and to get things wrong um, and to say the wrong thing mm. and yet to be able to get past that to get to those solutions uh, and, and better practices is a really important um, element because if that's not there then um, whether we're on zoom or in a face-to-face -face, the trust Math uh, issue is so important there that um, that we're all doing this for the right reasons and with the right motivation. Yeah, I think that's that's a very powerful point. Uh, and if I could say that our, our time has zoomed by, um, and I would like us to finish the discussion with those points, Nick, which are are, are really really on on the money from my point of view. And although I would love this to extend for as long as maybe we would have been able to if we'd been meeting uh, in Leicester, um, what I'm going to, to do with your uh, permission is to say uh, that I'm going to pass over uh, now to Rob Canton to ask him just to, as one of our hosts, just to bring this first Zoom session to a conclusion. Thank you, John. Um, when I was originally asked to do this, I thought that I would try to be a rapporteur and capture the main points that we've been discussing, but there have been so many and so many rich observations and so much to reflect on, and time is against us, so I'm going to be very, very brief. Um, I've learned a lot from this afternoon. The process, as well as the content, I think has been instructive, and in terms of the future viability of this project, it was important to see that we could have an event like this because for now and for a future of uncertain duration, it may be that this is how we're going to be doing international exchanges and cooperations. 
So to see that it is something that we can do, I think is for me quite exciting. And Abdul showed us that there are different formats as well as the substance uh, of his input. It was done in a different way. It was done through interviews, so presentations and interviews. The crisis in which we find ourselves makes for a, a, a creativity, doesn't it? I thought Anna made some really invaluable points about how we can imagine the future. We need to be able to imagine the future. And I'd go further and think that maybe we should be bold enough to think that there could be ways in which we might come to influence it. Um, we've been talking about supervisory methods and the changes that will be taking place. Uh, the point was made that there are going to be different crime patterns. So there's plenty of crime going on. Countries are reporting reductions in crime but there are sharp increases in domestic violence. In some places, there are sharp increases in hate crime and in xenophobia. And I think that this is important too, because an optimistic anticipation of our future is that it could lead to more solidarity, but it could just as well lead to greater hostility and, and suspicion and the breakdown of this concept of trust uh, that people have been emphasizing so vividly over the last few minutes. I'm thinking about the levels of exchange. So is international exchange just something that takes place at the level of policymakers? What about managers? What about practitioners? What about students learning together? Are there potential for opportunities of this kind internationally? And I certainly don't want to lose the point that was made by Nikki and also by Anna very powerfully about digital exclusion. The fact that the not just the equipment, but indeed the confidence and the comfort in using media of this sort is not available to everybody. And it could be that certain social injustices will be exacerbated by this new method of, of working. Um, many of us in this conference are trained in social work. And something that popped into my mind when we were talking was the concept of crisis intervention. And back in the day, we would, uh, when we were learning to be social workers, some of us were told about how at a time of crisis in people's lives, they were and indeed had to be receptive to different ways of being, different ways of understanding themselves and different ways of learning. And that that often could be really a fruitful thing to happen. Not everybody comes through their crisis, but crises, is, as we've said and seen, have bring these opportunities as well as the challenges quality of relationship that Vivian introduced for us and the importance of, of, of this. Some things can be conducted well, perhaps, or well enough um, online. Other things maybe not so well, and we perhaps need to find what fits where. Is it the case that all online conferences can accomplish is an exchange of information, or can, can we do better than that? And I think at the moment this is still territory to be explored. And Bill raised the very important matter of trust. Can you achieve trust in this way? I don't know. And I think uh, that's a conversation that I would enjoy picking up in future, future events. One of the big pieces of learning I took out from, from Abdul's interview with John was the, the political point about how international cooperation can and should fit together with the idea of national sovereignty. So many countries think that it is their privilege to run their affairs in their own way. And of course, we all understand that. But at the same time, some problems can't be, help, uh, can't be efficiently managed at that level. They do call for a level of international cooperation. And examples include counter-terrorism. And Abdul explained to us that some countries insist on doing their own thing against sometimes the, the, the flow of the, of the international uh, tendencies. But of course, the same goes for the virus. Uh, we have the World Health Organization telling us what, what ought to be done, international configurations, but also nation states sometimes conspicuously taking their own stand and saying, no, you're not going to tell us what to do. And of course, you'll forgive me if I can't resist at this point <coughs> commenting on Brexit because it was this suspicion that other countries were telling you what to do and trespassing on national sovereignty that lay behind an awful lot of the, uh, the, um, the motivation to, uh, to vote when people voted in the way that they did. Finally then, Bill's points about empowering personnel to deploy their talents, cultural change, how when we uh, 
intervene in other nations affairs and when we exchange knowledge and so forth this case study the bill offered has showed us how it's it's at that level and although Jan at the end reminded us that systemic change is something that isn't always achievable uh, it clearly is a, an aspiration and changing systems and cultures is a big part of that so I'm going to stop talking at that point as summary but John has also uh, kindly offered me the privilege of, of thanking you all um, so I would particularly like to thank the our main contributors Anna, Vivian, Abdul and Bill uh, and thank you to John as our moderator because especially with a, a difficult start when we were all working out which wires to plug in wherever um, we lost a bit of time so thank you so much John for for keeping the show on the road thanks to Rob Watson who's working there behind the scenes to ensure that if anything does go wrong he'd be there to pick us all up and thank you too for uh, to everybody for your contributions I've enjoyed this afternoon and I really hope that you've enjoyed it too and I'm very much looking forward to the the next event in a couple of weeks time thank you very much thank you